Hello, everybody, and welcome to Six Feet from Stardom, the show where I get Toronto musicians into this garage so that they can talk to me and also play music with me. Here we go, everybody. One, two, three, four. <laughs> under his own name and he played on all kinds of cool stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing Mark Goffrey. fun. It's kind of fun and different. Also something I didn't really think through when I was setting up instruments and planning this <laughs> planning this all out. Yeah. All right. Um, welcome, Mark, Am to I my show. Enough? Is that good for you? You got to get closer to that mic. You got to get right yeah. up on that nice thing. Nice up and snuggly. Yeah, I got to get snuggly. We want you to be snuggly. We want you to be in there, in people's ears, in their faces. Hi there. Hey, okay. Mark, I don't know why. I feel nervous. Dude, I know. I, so I feel nervous talking to you. So th Even like, though we're good friends. I was packing up, <laughs> and I was so nervous that I was going to forget something. This is like the first thing I've done in Right. Months. Well, what I'm what I'm finding about the odd because like yeah, we used to play several gigs a week. Like I used to have such a system. Like there's stuff that's in my car that never leaves. I've got the bag that has like X amount of patch cables, X amount of this and that. And like I didn't forget stuff cuz I had a system. Yeah. I have no system anymore. No, it's gone. So like any the odd times I do have to do stuff like I am there's so many mental checklists, so yeah. much like and see, we're kind of in a different... So we moved, like, right before the pandemic. Yeah, we even... So I straddle my base. Don't mind me. Um, so, yeah, so we moved right before the pandemic. And, like, everything has a place now. Mm -hmm. But do I know where any of the stuff that I need to play a gig is? No. Yeah. Because <laughs> I put it away. Yeah, I don't have my, like... indefinite period of time. I don't have my, like, it's by the door, ready to go. Because I moved during the pandemic, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so now, like, my my whole thing is so set up for like home studio mode not for like i'm a gigging musician mode and um it's weird man yeah but anyway i was nervous leaving because i'm like i'm going to forget yeah a chord and i didn't it was okay I and think, we have lots of extra have chords yeah. here lonnie's very accommodating so everything everything was always going to be fine yeah so um how you doing mark i've actually seen you like a fair bit during the pandemic so unlike locks? Unlike my previous guests, like I actually do kind of know how you're doing and I have to pretend for the for the show now. But um I don't know everything about what you've been up to. So I guess like how have you been getting through the pandemic? What's been what's it's, it been like for you? I mean, like everybody, there's ups and downs. Um mm -hmm. coming into so I had a record that was coming out the week before the pandemic, really shut everything down in in Toronto anyways. And so I was able to get like a bunch of shows in with that. And then, you know, that kind of like lull you fear after you release something where it's like, okay, now like what's the next thing going to be? Like the plug just got pulled. So you were in the lull. Right. Cause I remember you released your album. The album came out to one of your we, CD releases. Yeah. So we got six shows in and like had a cross Canada thing canceled. Right. Um, which like, you know, it was the cross Canada thing was far enough away from the release that it was like, okay, not like we lost money on 
flights and are still waiting for Air Canada to pay us Right, back. but you had the bookings. Like, you booked, totally. the, you oh, booked yeah. the basement and Yardbird. And, it was, it was yeah. all there. The contracts were signed. But the thing was really yeah. interesting is, like, that lull after the record comes out, you're like, all right, I'm going to start doing publicity. Everyone was kind of on the novelty of like, oh, so you're releasing music during the pandemic. I'm like, well, no, mine's mine's different. Like, it, right. mine came out. Can we can we talk about that? And it just, you know, it got swept under the rug a little bit. But it's almost yeah, that's almost worse than putting out a pandemic record because well, you're like, I feel like in our minds, the pre-pandemic is like a decade ago now. Yeah. It's like, well, and I will say though, I'm super grateful that we got the record out. Right. Because it was like it was awesome and I really didn't like that part of the release didn't get impacted mm-hmm. whereas like I know people who release something the next week. Right. You know, they and they're told like, "Oh yeah, we're not doing your shows." They're like, "Oh yeah, like yeah, because everything just shut down. Like that, if that radio interview is not happening, even things that now I've, we've figured out how to do social distance kind of stuff. Like I, when I put out the Jester Champwick stuff, it's like, yeah, I'm calling into radio interviews, and like everyone's kind of, everyone's kind of figured it out. But yeah, the people who are like trying to release an album like April third or something, it's like, oof. yeah, That's it a was. Hard but it was so like so the beginning of the pandemic was really interesting because of that because like. You know, you're on this high of like, okay, so I need to be starting to think of something new anyways. Right. So it, it, like, in some ways was like, okay, this makes sense. But then with the ambiguity of how long is this going to last, um, so, being the pandemic. So uh, have you been successfully writing music? I wouldn't say successfully. Right. I mean, we'll play a tune tonight that um, I wrote a little while ago. But my whole thing at the beginning, and even even now during the pandemic, I, I really wasn't wanting to fit what was happening before into like whatever the system was now. I would rather like do something completely new. So like my band was a quintet. There's no way that a quintet was going to yeah. be in the same room within the first four to five months of the pandemic. Right. So I just, I had no urge to write for that group. Um, That's how I felt too. I was like, I might be able to do something, but I can't write for my band right now. It's too sad. It's yeah. It's too sad to write music for people that I can't even see and play with. Yeah, Yeah. totally. So yeah, uh, yeah, I wouldn't say I was successful at writing stuff at the beginning. I was like, all right, I'm going to get, you know, there's some, some like bass related things I'm going to get together because I never have the time to do it. And that lasted for like a good couple weeks. Yeah. And then it's like, wait, why am I, you know, working on something that is a skill that like, yes, I will use down the road, but for the time being, I can't see, um, see the purpose. And that was really tricky. Um, I had to relearn how to practice because it's like a lot of the practicing that we do is like, okay, so there's a gig coming up at least now compared to like when we were in school or, um, even like, you know, coming out of school, it's like you kind of develop a regiment of like going through different things. And it just got to the point where, you know, we were busy. So it's like you learned new stuff for yeah. the gig and it then it was of, in your bag it had kind of just snowballed to a point where it's like yeah i don't need to like things are gonna keep the things i have to do are keeping me in shape like i don't need to like do it consciously anymore yeah so that was like that was a reset you yeah. know um and even now it's like i think the thing that i really dug about the way that we used to work on music was the variety of it yeah um to not to not have a good idea of like what you're going to be working on for the next six months that is outside of your own creative project. Right. So it's like, you have your own band, I have my own band, like you have your own thing that you're working on, but that's all supplemented by being able to like hang out with other people and then be thrust into something like three days before. Yeah. Like Cause you and I are both like, we both are band leaders of our own bands, but we're also in a lot of different projects. Like, I'm in the Lizards. We both are in Barbara Lika's band. Like, we're, you're, you play with Kelly Lee Evans. Like, you play with lots of different people. And, yeah, like, I could not agree with you more. Like, one of the things I miss the most is the variety, not just of the music I got to play, but of the people I got to see. Like, yeah. I, I mean, it's great. I feel like in the pandemic, what's happened to everyone, and not even musicians, is, like, you've gotten a lot closer. And I think I even read an article about this. Like, like you're, you're, like, close bonds like if you think of your social circle as like these expanding outward circles and it's like your immediate family and then your close friends it's like this is good but this the i guess if this is going to be a podcast i can't just be doing a visual (laughs) thing right (laughs) now um but the wider circle like is gone you know and like the expanding circles out like to the point where like you know you, you don't see your favorite bartender anymore you don't 
have that like little bit of banter with your barista like you know i don't know we're all just missing those looser connections I feel like. yeah and one of the things to that point that was really interesting for me is like stuff that i used to rely on as a fail safe to pull me out of whether it was a funk whether it was like maybe i wasn't working as much at a mm-hmm. certain period of time um all those mechanisms were gone you couldn't go to a show somewhere yeah. and know you're going to see you know, 10 to 20 people you at least know. Maybe you're not close with them, but you know, like, so Jeff, like I haven't really seen Jeff since yeah. the since, gig that we played. Since our Bud Powell tribute, probably. Right, so it's like, yeah. you know, but any night of the week I could go to Rep's Auto and like, oh, the, yeah, Jeff's there, I can hang out and, yeah, you know. Yeah, um, and if, if you had a weekend where you didn't have work, like you could probably go see your friends and sit in and kind of keep the performing thing sharp and... But so yeah. like that, that was gone. Like that type of, um, you know, like I said, so you're having a funk. You're just, you're not, you're not being productive or, or maybe you just need a break. Maybe you've been really productive and you just need to, mm-hmm. oops, you need to go see something else. Um, that was something that I found really hard because like I didn't realize how much I was going out to socialize. Yeah. You know, um, again, yeah. with people you only see occasionally on gigs. I kind of talked about this with Allison, but it's like, yeah, we both got our socializing from our job in a way that I don't know if people in other jobs really do. Like we had this musicians, I think all have this gray area, like uh, a fuzzy line that separates your social life and your work life. Like, you know, like pretty much all of my friends are musicians that I work with in some capacity. There's definitely some people that I'm like more friends with than I am coworkers, but like there's never a, perfectly clear delineation like but that's super highlighted right now yeah because there are people who i haven't seen who i know i would love to see Mm -hmm. uh but you know you can only also have this conversation so much like oh how's your pandemic going it's like oh this which is like really interesting for you doing this kind of like weekly where it's like you get a different perspective from each person and yeah i mean a big part of why i started doing this was to recreate that so many of the things we're talking about like even if people aren't watching it's like I got to have the feeling of like, we're preparing some music for this week. So I got to practice. Yeah. I do Like when I started doing solo, even like early pandemic, when I did solo live streams, I was like, I don't care if five people watch. This is an excuse for me to learn four Thelonious Monk songs. Like, and like, that's, you know, yeah, that's just like value to me in and of itself. Like, well, and that's, I mean, that's one of the really interesting, again, you were talking about practicing. So, um, starting to reapproach music from not someone needs me to do this, but this is something I want to do. Yeah. Or this is something that is going to inspire me to work on other things. And that's even different than like, oh yeah, this is a skill I want to get together. Cause that's, that's, you know, its own thing. But there, for me, there's been more of like a, a childlike enjoyment with the bass and in particular with listening to music, mm. which has been really interesting. And I think it's got to have something to do with the fact that like my ears aren't tired. Yeah. Because, like, you think about, you know, you play a gig on a Wednesday night, 10 till 2, like, you're not going to listen to music on your way home. You're going to get up in the morning, and unless you're, like, prepping for something else, at least I wasn't, like, you know, like, I, you needed a break. And now I just, you know, I don't, I'm not listening, or I'm not seeing as much music, I'm not playing as much music, so I'm finding listening to be way more rewarding. Yeah, that. That is interesting. Like, yeah, that it's, and I've found the same thing to be true. It's like the tank, the the tank of like how much music I can take in in a day or a week is not as full, and um, and yeah, it's just like, yeah, like, I I it kind of being in the pandemic kind of reminds me of being a music student again in a lot of ways. Like the thing you were talking about about, like I am just waking up and thinking, what do I want to do, which is hard. Like. I miss having the push of like, well, you're playing with that person. You got to kill that gig. You got to learn that music. I don't even have to think about it. It is a lot of extra work to think like, what do I want to do with my day, with my time, with my life, really? Yeah, let alone whatever I want to do tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's one thing to figure out, oh, yeah, how are you going to spend today? Because that's how I used to do it pre-pandemic. Yeah. But the cool thing about it is that I've gotten to do some stuff that I didn't have time for before, like my my project with Curtis or learning how to mix or whatever. It really was like, okay, if I was going to make some music, what would I even do? Yeah. And all of, all of the good things that are like that, that have happened in the pandemic, it's also important to note, wouldn't be possible without 
essentially the fact that we're on UBI. Like, right. You know, totally. The fact that I get money from the government to like stay home and stay safe until my job comes back because they screwed up <laughs> right? Yeah. and made a pandemic and didn't stop a pandemic from happening. So, and they want, anyways, I just think it's just also made me realize like how nice would it be if everyone got to feel this way in a sense, like if everyone kind of knew like the, the absolute basic essentials, you don't have to work you don't have to worry about, you don't have to grind and you get to have more time to think like, what do I want to do? How do I want to contribute to my community, to culture, to whatever, you know, it's been, it's been kind of nice to have that, get to ask myself that question every day. See, it's really interesting. So when, so like I teach, right. And and as I'm sure a lot of the people who you've had, I know a couple of them do for sure. For sure. Um, Almost, almost every musician has some degree of teaching going on. yeah. Yeah. So that first March break, uh, when the school shut down, because the school shut down on Thursday, I emailed all my students, me like, "Hey, I'm going online." Like, right. this is before we knew whether people were coming back. And the thing is, the couple schools that I teach at, I'm usually, you know, I'm in Brampton one day, I'm in like a different part of Toronto another day, but you can only fit in so many students. So instead of uh, the half hour back to back, all my kids were like, "Hey, let's do full hour lessons." Right. So it's it it was cool on one hand because it meant that you know, this work kept going, but I was now teaching twice as much right. as I was pre-pandemic. And, and you're teaching twice as much online and not in person, which is like... Totally. A different, like, yeah. But it's interesting how, like, so, like, this version of UBI, like, what's happening right now, it's, like, the energy that, like, because I didn't, like, I wanted to get into, like, the, the home recording and that kind of thing. And then you realize it's like, oh, wait, no, I have these, you know, 15 to 20 hours of teaching that I'm doing. It's like, that's, well, it's, you know, it's not like I would be on that stuff, but it's, it's just so interesting to kind of like reset my brain because that's more what I feel like I've done with the last year than, than actually being an artist. And, you know, we're talking about practice and that kind of thing. But you feel like teaching has been like your main, it has been my main, it's been your work. It's been my work and it's, it's taken a different, you know, you're talking online. So it's been a different preparatory approach to it. Um, students that I used to teach were all really good with like making music together. Right. I mean, this is a really physical instrument. So, um, and the students that I teach are not necessarily orchestral. They're like bass players in a wind program and that kind of thing. So it's like all these students have just lost their, their, you know, musical exploration with other people. Right. Right. And like there's, it's harder for you to fill that lesson now because there isn't like, well, let's look at your ensemble piece. Let's look at your whatever. That's and so true. you can, like, it's cool because you can and develop you a trajectory. Play, and you can't play with them. Like, that's what I that's found the about thing. the online teaching, too, is, like, like with my students, a lot of the time, it would be like, okay, learn that thing, and then I'm going to play along with you, and now you'll, like, know what it's like to play with someone else. We can't do that. So it's like, you have to fill the lesson purely with this online exchange. Though, you can listen to music easier. Right. Like it's, you know, I think there was a different understanding for checking out music for a lot of my younger students. So you get your students like in the lesson, you're just like, we're going to listen to this. If there's, if there's something, I mean, not for an hour, like, you know, like their parents are paying me to teach them something. But, um, so one of the things that, uh, I've noticed with a lot of students is no one knows how to listen to music. Hmm. Right. So it's, it's very much a subconscious thing for, I, I mean, I know in my family growing up, like music would be on, but my folks weren't sitting around just listening to it. Right. You know, it was, it was just a, something in addition to whatever else was going on. Um, so when my students and I are listening to music, it's like, okay, Hey, let's listen to this specific thing. And it's really interesting because, you know, you can pick a tune that, that they know, you know, like someone not related to anything that you're, you're studying with them mm-hmm. and then teaching them, Hey, what do you hear? you know, and then breaking it down. And then when you start introducing them to like stuff that you're working on, they have an awareness of how they're going to actually check out like that music and that kind of thing. So it's been interesting because adding that stuff into the preparation for the online, like, don't get me wrong, the online teaching, I find to be much harder because, and this is going to sound silly, but it's because it takes more preparation because the stuff that I've I've prepared right now is not stuff that you can translate online. You're doing more work outside of the lesson than you normally would be. So yeah. like, you know, each hour lesson is now you have, you know, I, whether it's 10 minutes ahead and 20 minutes after or whatever, it's like, mm. there's a good 30 minutes per kid right now. 
Um, they wow. just I mean, that shows a lot of dedication on your part. I, I have a couple of online students right now, and I'm definitely not doing a half hour I, well, prep for each I just, minor, minor high school students. Yeah. You know, like... What, what am I doing? It's, like, I really... <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's... I don't know. Like, that's the closest thing to structure that I have right now. You know, so it's like... Yeah. Because I'm going to have a better time next week if I've, like, you know, taken down the... Like, this is all the stuff that school teachers actually do. Right. You know, it's like, so here we are as musicians, like complaining about teaching and that kind of thing. It's like, well, yeah, this, this takes work to do I this well. I can't even imagine people who are doing classrooms like that right now. I just, no, it's, it's incredible to me. Yeah. But, it's, yeah. It's but it, anyways, it's, you know, it's been interesting. So like that has been my main source of income over. And it's, you know, I was talking to someone about this today. Like the students are tired, yeah. right? Because some of them went through the summer, which has never happened before. But like parents just wanted students have activities uh so the grind is really i mean I'm, i think everyone's feeling may as being just like yeah pulling i teeth, feel like but. i have kid. i have a couple who are like young kids because i teach piano and like they're done like a seven-year-old who's had like had regular school in front of a screen all day and then it's like 5 30 and it's like time to get in front of your screen and do a piano lesson now it's yeah. like no yeah like, I don't, I totally get it that they're checked out or like that they don't really feel like being in the lesson. And yeah, but I mean, it sounds like you're putting in the work that it takes to actually make it a good experience for them though, which is nice. I mean, I, again, they're playing bass, right? So like this instrument is not one that unless you're, unless you're one of those people who can really sit down at the age of 10 and you're digging the YouTube thing, like this is an instrument you play with people, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah, for sure, you know, it's usually... <laughs> it was a crappy guitar player who became the bass player. Kind of, and yeah. That was me. Like I, I could not play guitar. And so I'm like, well, I can, I can play bass. And so then I was playing, you know, music with, with friends. Um, and so my goal is just to have these students not hate music at the end of it, because a lot of, again, yeah. a Which, lot and do. that's it. Cause the, the learning how to listen is such a big part of that. And like, yeah. I think a lot of people don't, incorporate that into their teaching i know i don't really and it's important because like it's listening to music is becoming a lost art and like really playing is listening especially if you're going to be playing with other people and so that's kind of what i was saying yeah. about like my ears feeling more rested yeah you know to be able to listen to music and that kind of and so it's cool it's like you know i'm checking out bass lines again that i've been listening to for you know 20 years and like picking up stuff again and being so like now i'm excited to like listen to it with you know, with the kids and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, it's interesting. Cause it's like, it's not the same as being an artist for me anyways. If there's something beautiful about it, but it's, it's not creating the yeah. same way. It's not, I mean, it's, it's important. I, and like, I think I like, I think it's an equally like deep and wonderful passion, but it is just different than being an artist and making things totally for sure. What's like, um, like, I guess now that are you kind of planning a reopening, like with your band, are you looking at what you might do in the fall or I've got, I've got some, so <laughs> for a year I didn't do much writing. And then in March, uh, I was like, all right, I just need to go somewhere and, and actually isolate, like not in my apartment kind of thing. Like I want to get out of the city. And so I went up to a friend's cottage and I did, um, just like a two week writing retreat. And the idea was I was just going to practice and try and come up with new material. Yeah. Um, I totally thought of doing that too. And then just didn't do it. I mean, yeah. like I had to plan awesome. it in December, yeah. you know what I mean? Like again, that's like, it was kind of like planning a tour. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so I went up and I, I did that. And so my game plan was to write, um, a bunch of new quintet music. But what ended up happening is, uh, writing a whole bunch of music that was kind of more designed for like duos and trios hmm. because again if right. cause here's the thing like i could take you know very easily adapt this for for the quintet but ideally for sure. you could do anything with it but yeah it's when you're writing you're at least for me when i'm writing i'm imagining this music existing in the future and that's what's inspiring me to write is that like this song is going to exist people are going to hear it people are going to play it so like when I'm writing, it does have to, like, it gets in the writing right away, the idea that, like, for me, it's Jeff and Adam are going to play. Like, who it. like, it's going to be. I'm thinking yeah, yeah, about yeah. them as I'm writing it. So it's like, if we're in the pandemic and I can't, and you, like, 
I could totally see this. Like you're in the pandemic and it's hard to imagine a quintet playing your music. It's going to be hard to write quintet music. Yeah. And I mean, and like, and it's, it is alert, like it's acoustic music, right? So mm-hmm. it's ideally you're dealing with immediate interaction. Um, so when I was just up there working on it, I found that the thing that I was gravitating towards was, was not writing for that way. Yeah. Um, but again, the whole purpose of going up there and doing this, this retreat was just to, to get a, like, I have a book full of ideas now, um, right. from, cause again, the, like I find, com- I find composition so challenging. Like I, it, if I could never write another tune again and still play music, like I'd be mm-hmm. totally fine with it. But like, I learned a long time ago that I really dig playing other people's music. Yeah. I love like, like we were saying, I love getting the call the day before and then you've got to learn the stuff and you go and then you do it and like, then you do it again and that kind of thing. Writing music I find to be so challenging. So for me to get up to, you know, the middle of nowhere and uh, like try writing for like two weeks straight was like a completely different experience. And it was yeah. good because I got stuff down. Yeah. But um, yeah, that would be hard. I'm sure you hit a lot of walls at times and like, just like, yeah, I mean the way. Th- so like, I took a bu- like I took my whole rig. There's a piano up there. I took. I thought you were gonna say, well, I took a bunch of acid. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah the whole new person when I came back. No, so I took like I took my electric. I took this. I took a guitar, and the way that I tend to write these days is like I'll be working on something specific. Maybe it's maybe I'll be improvising, or maybe I'll be like you know, just working on a Arco technique. And then eventually, like after 40 minutes or whatever, that will turn into, oh, here's an idea and I'm going to develop right. it. So to have had the time where like each day, like there wasn't a student waiting, right? There wasn't, you know. Yeah, like, you don't, you aren't like, I have an hour and a half. Like, and totally. then I got to do this other thing. It's like I had an hour to do whatever. And then, oh, and now I'm here for another hour and a half working on this this one little idea. And, oh, I didn't get anything. That's fine. Or like, or I did. And so it was, it was amazing. Cause that's the closest I felt to being an artist since right. those album release shows. It's funny. I feel the same way about writing as you, even though like I write music too. And I, I definitely write music because at some point I realized it's something I have to do. It's funny. I was, I remember when I had a gig with the, this producer, Tom Darcy, and he was talking about being the exact opposite. He's like, I always wanted to write songs and at a certain point, I realized I have to learn how to play an instrument in order oh, to that's write. Funny. In order to write songs, and I was like, "It's the exact opposite." I loved playing an instrument, and at a certain point, I realized, "Oh, you really get to do this even more if you write your own music." Like, yeah. I guess I have to, I guess I have to write my own music so that I get to like play more. Yeah, I like the reason I write is so that I can play the type of music I want to play. Then that's not to say that the bands that I play in is not stuff that I want to do, but you know, um, the type of music that I'm really, really, really enthusiastic about, uh, is played in people's bands up here. Right. Right. So it's like, you're not getting that, that one off call to go and play contemporary, you know, jazz influenced music. No, Um, because eventually you realize like that when you develop a, a band that has a vibe and has history and relationships, it's just really hard to beat that with. Yeah. Like, two rehearsals and let's play the gig yeah and i mean it's it's different just the sheer number of people Mm -hmm. right like you know i'm and i'm speaking this and comparing it to like the time i spent in new york kind of thing where it's like you're never going to get the people on your record yeah i also think that like developing a band over a long period of time is a way of compensating for like personal musical shortcomings (laughs) sure sure yeah i feel that i'm like yeah i'm like okay like yeah if i was a better if like on a pure musical ability level if i was better I could probably have an awesome band with different guys all the time, but I'm like, it's not like that. Like, I'm, I'm only this good. So I need to like have played with the same guys for a thousand gigs. I mean, know? but it, it's super rewarding though. Yeah. You know, being in one of those groups or like that being your, I mean, you know, you've been playing with the, the Boogaloo squad now for oh, dude, four yeah, years, seven, five years. No, more. Is it longer? It's like seven or eight. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, you get into, you get into a place. And it's, it's cool. It's just, it's just different. And that's, um, though writing music is a great way to get to that place. That was, I mean, here's the other thing. I never studied writing music. Like, sure. We went to music school, but like, I didn't study composition. Yeah, I didn't. You know, like I I would work on it in like private lessons with people, but like, that's about it. But like you hear about the people who, you know, it depends on, depends on what your influences are, but like 
you read about people, oh yeah, they studied composition for two years. You know who else didn't study composition? Bob Dylan. I mean, do you know that? <laughs> did, like, I mean, did, like maybe not no, I know. musically. It's... Maybe he studied oral composition. No, I think he. I mean, first of all, I'm just being. First of all, I'm just being silly, but Paul McCartney. No, I mean, um, I I'm, think like actually, I think what well Bob Dylan in an interview actually said he's like he just learned folks like he learned a thousand songs and he's like look if you learned totally yeah if you had learned all of these uh like hank williams songs you would have written this song right you know and that like he really feels that way he's like really like i'm not a genius i just well and i think like, as a I piano player everything and then i was the next logical step like the type like so when you were learning classical piano um or even like solo piano regardless of the genre you're learning mm -hmm like how to arrange and compose at the same time, right? More so than I think yeah. this, yeah, this, old, this old guy. learning jazz piano is learning, like learning how to play jazz piano is learning how to compose in real time in a lot of ways. Yeah, because you're looking at a sketch and you're filling in all the blanks. Yeah. But anyway, so we tangented here. But to answer your question, so this summer the game plan is to do a bunch of these uh, duo and trio. Oh yeah, that's recorded. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, it, it spiraled <laughs> yeah. into the composition thing, but yeah. So, so um, your band's fired. No, it's it's all the same people. It's right. just not all at the same time. Right. Um, oh, that's gonna be awesome. I think that's gonna be really nice. You could have an album that's yeah, like these different combinations and pairings. And yeah, I mean, ideally, what like what I'd like to do is it's gonna be a bunch of, uh, with the exception of the one that includes piano, it'll be a bunch of stuff that is outdoor and basically like field recordings of yourself playing with the group because again the, the essence is acoustic right so it's like for it to be you know insert whatever environment whether it's out at the beaches or like you know right provincial park or something the idea is like okay so like we're gonna record a few versions of this tune so you want to like be in places yes. and like you kind of you want the sounds yeah. of the environment to be in yeah. the recording because because again like you know for for me like i put out a record and it's cool and it it you know, I did pretty well as far as I'm concerned for having not actually gotten to tour it. Mm -hmm. um, but I want I want to do something where like there's a little bit more of a video component and that the video and the audio are like, it's the same thing and it's not a music video. It's like, okay, so let's capture the audio and video of whatever right. this like, whole thing like is. The, the thing I'm making artistically is this. It's as opposed me. to like when we make a trailer for our video where right. it's like, because again, I've done that and it's cool, but I, whenever I'm doing it, I'm like, ah, I've, there's an artistic opportunity here that I've totally missed. Yeah. Right. Um, which it's fine. It's like, it's commercial. Like it's for advertising. Yeah, a lot of times we're following the playbook of like, this is what you do when you want to make music. This is how you make an album. This is how you release an album. There's all these kind of like, there's a lot of shoulds all yeah. along the way that maybe we don't question as much. And that's again, to kind of come back to the, the pandemic thing, that's kind of what I mean about not wanting to do the same thing I've been doing, but fitting into the pandemic model. Right. whatever this is like i would rather it be something that is new like new in, in the sense of like i haven't written that music i yeah. haven't tried doing new a video you. series yeah. yeah yeah as opposed to like hey here's my thing like can it can it work because oh, i've just been so disappointed so many times this year yeah already you know yeah. um <laughs> and that's i mean everyone has right that's yeah. it's not i'm not special in that regard um, for sure but no it is really the, the name of the game in the pandemic is managing your expectations in a healthy way where you're not hopeless but you're also not getting constantly disappointed by your hopes not working out yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, um yeah well mark i think we've been chatting for a little while here and i'm sure we could go on and on but why don't we play one of these why don't we play this new song of yours oh, since we've been mirage late since we've been talking about your sort of new earthy approach to jazz composition get jeff and rich back in here why can you not be cussing on the show they can hear you there's these are live mics they don't want to hear that potty mouth of yours though Um, so just just so everyone listening knows, this is a song. Not only have we never played it together, never rehearsed it, no one has ever played this song 
brand new. So we didn't even have a recording to kind of go off of. You didn't even have some like MIDI pre-pro nothing. Oh, did you want that? <laughs> Sorry, guys. Like, like all this time. I, honestly, I, like, would, I wouldn't have listened to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah. This is like we're just. We're just hacking at the paper cold right now. gonna play it. This is, this is great. It's gonna be great. Uh, so this is uh, Mirage Lake, written by Mark Godfrey in 2021. 
super nice. All right. Um, oh yeah, that's gonna be tricky now, Mark, because I like to talk in between the songs too. So I don't to know. Me? If you, I can, I can, I can lean. Do you want to lean this or what do you want to do? But yeah, that's really nice. Thank you. Um, how does it? How did that feel? That was it was your great. First time, first that's time it. hearing your tune. Yeah. Maybe no. You get maybe you don't it. need to hire your normal band. Maybe. What what band? <laughs> <laughs> this is this is the most of a band that I've played with. Okay, so I thought it would be fun to right after this one to play, just to really show how far we've come <laughs> as Uh-oh. as artists. Um, so. I mean, probably everyone watching this is thinking, when are they going to talk about Rorschach? <laughs> everyone watching is like two musicians from the band Rorschach that we've definitely heard of together making music again. Again, with longer hair. Yeah, this is like this is like Simon and Garfunkel getting back together, you and me, you know? It's like Miles and Coltrane. No, I mean, this is this is bad. It's close to doing. Lennon McCartney, <laughs> really. <laughs> what I'm doing right now is really bad. Um, okay, no. So, Mark and I used to be have a quartet uh, called Rorschach that also had Derek Gray in it and Jeff Larochelle in it. And in 2013, we did a residency at the Banff Center where we kind of like wrote a lot of our music and kind of formed as a band. And then we made two records. Yeah, there's an EP and there's a and there's a full length. And um, we were we were kind of young jazz bucks, and we were just trying to. I don't know about you, I was trying to write the hardest music I could think of. Yeah, I mean, coming out of school, that's like kind of what I learned from university, right? You write hard music. Yeah. And if people can't like, play it, it's their fault. People look at your chart and they're like, "Whoa, that's hard. Nice yeah. work." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice work, buddy. Yeah. And I think it's interesting that both you and I, like, if you look at our writing now, like, you look at what I write for Boogaloo Squad, and and not that you don't still write challenging music sometimes, and me too, but, like, we've definitely, I think, matured in an interesting way with what we're trying to write. And it's not so much, like, it's not so much that we're trying to write easier music now. It's just that w- I think you and I both have a clearer idea of what we're, what we're trying to say musically. It's interesting. I think with writing, at least... When I was younger, when I was trying to, I was trying to write what I heard other people improvising, right? Yeah. So you write in such a way, it's like, oh yeah, that sounds like someone's approach to this. Whereas now, I would rather write in such a way that is like open enough that like two great musicians who like I rarely play with can just read something and like they come out on the page. Yeah. Um, and I mean, you can still do that with a band as well. It doesn't, you know, just because it's like a, a pickup game no, doesn't mean anything. But like, be even better with a familiar ensemble. Yeah. But yeah, so it's like I would rather write music that like people aren't sweating, trying to read. You know, have yeah. two ver like you know, you know, you've got this kind of stuff, you've got the other too. So, and I'm not trying to trash Rorschach. Like I actually am really proud of those records we made, and I I think the band sounded good and had some cool stuff going on. And I really think we all grew a lot in that band and had a lot of fun times. And I actually, when we were talking about doing this and being like, should we dust off a Rorschach tune? I got really excited, like listening to them and being like, oh yeah, these songs. Um, so anyways, I was thinking like, what's one that's, what's one of the Rorschach songs that's easy enough? This is the closest to a tune. This is the have. closest <laughs> thing we have to like a song you could just pick up. Because some of the stuff is so ridiculous with the 13-8 time signatures and that was part of the approach though that like we were like it was only that band you couldn't sub into that band yeah no one could have no one could fill into rorschach because we started the band by rehearsing every day for like six hours in a hut in banff you know so like that's kind of how it happened anyways uh this is actually a song that i wrote for rorschach um you can actually still find rorschach songs it's on spotify it's on spotify still it's on apple music Check it's it on Bandcamp. the PayPal still goes to yeah. one of our yeah, addresses. Yeah, that's true. We can yeah. still make money We've got a it. Tumblr. Um, um, I mean, if you want to spend money, though, what I should mention is uh, the tips that we're doing for tonight. That would be the best. You can probably see in the comments below, I have a PayPal money pool. If you enjoy watching this show, listening to us play and listening to me and Mark, you know, <laughs> jabber on, then uh, toss us a few bucks, why don't you? And now we're going to play a song that I haven't even thought about in probably... Well, 2013 was eight years ago. So, yeah, I would have wrote this song probably about eight years ago. And um, 
you can really hear that I was listening to a lot of Aaron Parks at the time, and I just wanted him to be my friend. And I even paid him once to hang out with me when I was in New York City. And um, this is what came of it. <laughs> Wait, you wrote this after th- after that? Yeah, I got a lesson okay. with him in like 2011 or something. Yeah, anyways. He lived in Brooklyn at the time. Who doesn't? Yeah, they all. Aaron Goldberg, who I doesn't live in Brooklyn. He's got a nice little mm-hmm. Manhattan place. At least he did seven years ago. Anyways, this isn't interesting. Here we go. <laughs> one, two, one, two, three, one, two. <laughs>
All right, thanks, Harry. Oh, the memories, eh? Oh, boy. They just come flooding back. Nice. So, yeah, that was like our easiest song. Was, uh, Same spots are still an issue for me. I know. <laughs> no, for sure. It's like coming that weird part at the end. You really can really hang you up. I just think it's so funny, like, thinking about some of the gigs we used to play. Because so I wondered if we were going to talk about, like, the Ottawa one. Yeah, like, like the Christmas party. Oh, dude, I totally forgot about that. Yeah. We were playing, like, we... There was a gig from, like, 2011 until 2015 at Brook Street Hotel in Ottawa. Not even in Ottawa, in Canada. In Canada, the Options Jazz Lounge. Yeah, and they had, like, a big fake electric grand. like One of the Clavinovas. Yeah. And, um, and they would like, I just, like, who was hiring music? Like, they're like, you obviously just want some nice background jazz in your lounge. Don't hire this, like. <laughs> As someone on their way to play, like, upstairs jazz in Montreal. It's not. <laughs> don't hire these people who are coming in to play, like, complex, loud, modern, odd time signature dissonant jazz. Like, we had songs that were, like, based on, like, 12-tone rows and stuff. <laughs> and we're like. People are like trying to like people are trying to like eat their like artichoke dip and like watch the game and like yeah was... yeah because the reason this was built was for the senators, uh, vis- the teams visiting the senators yeah. to play because Canada there's nothing in Canada it's a wasteland but yeah. then they have their hockey arena there so it's like yeah like for people who are like looking for a drink after the game and I guess we were there around well, Christmas so, yeah because we. Well, yeah. <laughs> We went to Montreal to record our EP at McGill. Yeah. And we stopped here, like, on the way there. For us, it was a no-brainer. A bit of money, they put you up but, for the night, so you save a night's accommodations. Like, but, like, a week before, they're like, yeah. hey, so you know, we've booked a Christmas party in the lounge the night of your guys' performance. Mm. And so they were... They were asked, they can were, you just play Christmas songs? <laughs> <laughs> And did what did we do? Like, did we say like, no, like we're we're like a band and we're coming to play our music? I, I would like to think that's what we said, but I I, I don't feel know like well, I definitely remember playing Christmas songs. What I'm trying to remember is if we like compromised and we were like, can we do a set of our? Oh stuff? well, we definitely did our stuff. We played our whole book. I know that. Yeah, I think we played. I think we settled on like we're still playing all of our songs that no one there wants to hear. And then, but then we'll play like Jingle Bells. It's like when a cover band's like, all right, we're going to throw an original in here now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> totally. Totally. Yeah, wow. Just hilarious. I, Anyways, I, what gigs were you talking about? I was thinking about like playing like Manhattan's in Guelph, which is like a an Italian restaurant that has a little stage gone with a piano. Is it? Yeah, I drove by. Oh, uh, that's I too bad. Done. Yeah. That's too bad. Like, I definitely have since played gigs there that made a lot of sense, like lounge jazz with a singer. Everyone's enjoying their meals. It's great. But like we like for us to come there and like people are like yeah, people are like eating some nice uh, you know, veal parmesan or whatever, and then it's like yeah, it's like weird atonal music. <laughs> You're gonna try and bust one of them out. I was trying to remember how fortune cookie goes. Ba ba da ba 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 da ba ba da da That's the twelve tone one. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> you get the idea, everybody. <laughs> Oof. Oof. Yeah. Uh, so that was a great time in our lives. Wouldn't change it for anything. Um, why don't we now move on to actually, Rich? Maybe you can take a little break. Oh. Because um, Mark, you and I have always really liked the music of Bud Powell, and I feel like you're someone that I've always been like. Do you know any Bud Powell tunes? Because a lot of people don't, and you'd always be like, "Yeah, I do." And then I'd, we would hang out and play Bud Powell music. And then one of the one of like m- not like probably within my last ten gigs of 2021 was the Burdock Piano Fest asked me to put something together, and I was like, "I've only been writing music for the organ for the last six years. I don't have any new jazz, any new piano stuff." So I just called you, and I was like, "Do you want to just do a night of Bud Powell music?" And you're like, sweet. And then I called Jeff, and he was down. Uh, for those of you who don't know who Bud Powell is, uh, amazing uh, bebop piano player. Probably like considered kind of the foundational bebop piano player in a lot of ways. Like, he's a contemporary of Charlie Parker. He was around for like the Mitten sessions in Harlem, which kind of people sort of feel like was the breeding ground of bebop jazz in the 40s. And uh, he was, is, 
and inc- made incredible music, wrote amazing music, and um, had a pretty tragic life where, you know, racism and uh, bad run-ins with uh, racist and abusive cops led to him being in and out of rehabs and mental institutions and all kinds of stuff. And um, it's amazing that we got the music we got, but you do have to wonder what else we would have gotten from Bud Powell if, uh, you know, the world had been a different way. Do you know if the name of this tune has significance? Oh, for name? sure. These, this tune, I think, and he, he wrote tunes about, like, his mental health issues and the fact that he'd been in and out of these, like, institutions for mental health at the time. And, like, this one is called Un Poco Loco, which means a little crazy. So he's, or, like, he had a bit of a sense of humor about it. And then when he was, um, I'm trying to think of like the right term for like when you're in, when you're institutionalized. Committed? Yeah, when he was committed. Thank you. Um, he also wrote the tune Glass Enclosure about like the feeling of being trapped. And even those like Amazing Bud Powell recordings, like I forget if it's Amazing Bud Powell Volume 1 or Volume 2, but one of them like he, they like, the record company like pleaded with the hospital, like, can he leave to do like, we, we want him to make these records. He's like a brilliant piano player. And he was only allowed to go with a nurse accompanying him. So like those, those sessions, there's like someone from the institution, like sitting there making sure everything's okay while he makes some of the greatest music of the 20th century. Like it's just, yeah, it's just mind blowing. And um, this tune is definitely, I think he was trying to get out some of the frustration and anger and challenges that he faced in his life, and you can really hear it in the music. Um, Let's do it, guys. It's also a really hard song that we might not play so good. Yeah. (laughs) Let's let's go. All right. I'm going to count it in like that, even though those are half notes. One, two, three, four.
Disco Loco uh, yeah, by the yeah. great Bud Powell. And uh, yeah, thanks for uh, relearning that one, guys. It's a, it's a crazy song. It's so cool. Written in like the late 40s, I believe. Um, so, what else should we talk about? <laughs> Sometimes I don't have something to talk about between each song, and it's a little... Well, where are we going? What's that? We could talk about... What, I was thinking we'd do one of yours next. So, yeah, actually, no, this is a good opportunity to, to plug your things and whatever. Um, so, uh, in addition to uh, tipping us for tonight, if anyone really wants to uh, support all things Mark Godfrey, um, you should check out his existing albums. So that so you re- this song that we're about to play is on the album you released that most just recently. Came out. Yeah. Well, so just it didn't ago. just came out, but no, it, it, it came it came out in a different world, quite frankly. Very but, true. Uh, uh, just before the pandemic hit, Mark had the un- the misfortune of releasing an album and then having the whole world get shut down, and you didn't get to tour your album and stuff like that, but I think people still listen to it and like it a lot. I know I like it. This one has been... Spotify keeps putting it on playlists. Nice, dude. It's crazy. Like, thousands of... Like, tens of thousands of plays. That's awesome. Nice. I mean, yeah. That's I've, like, I've made, I think, ten bucks. You probably... Yeah. You're you're probably hitting almost... You're, I was going to say, you're no, probably... No, it's in, actually quite sad when you go into You're probably in double-digit territory yeah. there. Oh, yeah. 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 It's heavy. Heavy stuff. That's very cool. Do you use a uh, Submit Hub? Uh, this one I used CD Baby. Oh. You know, Submit Hub is like a thing where you like send your music to like Spotify playlisters. And this stuff like one that. I used CD Baby. CD Baby does no, that too? No, I have no idea. Okay, anyways. Um, no, matter. so Not when I released as a single, right. because this is one of the, was one of the singles, and so I released it a couple weeks before, and it's just been in there, I don't know. Well, I, I, I promised you I'd get like all the links before the show. I have them all. Okay, I didn't, but you got them anyways. <laughs> uh, so uh, check out the comment section below. You can find links to uh, check out Mark's music. You sell like vinyls and everything. I right? do, yeah. 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 So this if there's any, any of you vinyl lovers out there, you can get a vinyl of the Mark Godfrey Quintet, which has this song on it. It does. USS Rent-A-Car. All right. <laughs> Let's do it. You just started on your own? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Take it. Take it away, baby.
Yeah. You get a you get a real variety here on Six Feet from Stardom. <laughs> People who watched last week were like, they played Hall and Oates and Paul Simon, <laughs> and it was fun. <laughs> I'm who who's Mike cheating on Mike for both Oh my <laughs> yeah. Oh you guys are cheating on the base player already. <laughs> it only took a week, eh? Mike, you Man, need... I was saying I don't know if Mike's watching anymore, but I had Mike for Folia's song list on my res room door because I went to a show at Joe Mama's. We talked and, talk, and that... he gave it to me. And I'm like <laughs> he's like, Yeah, just learn all the tunes on this list. And I fucking went home and I did it. That's and, so great. <laughs> But anyways, I found that piece of paper. I still have it. We even talked about that last week, like the whole experience of going to Joe Mama's and meeting Calvin or meeting Mike and being like them kind of giving you the keys to the kingdom of like what to do to get like get gigs and be working in Toronto and stuff. That's so interesting. Yeah. And he uh, he was, I mean, not too impressed that the next person coming on was going to only play bass. (laughs) Sorry, and Mike. Not play bass and sing, so you know. You're I mean, I could I could sing some backups poorly for something. <laughs> yeah, Let's, we should play a Barbara Lika song <laughs> yeah. and just not have the lead vocals, yeah. but we we each play our you. parts and sing our backups. <laughs> that would be really fun. <laughs> That'd be really fun for everyone. Um, okay, no, Mike, Mark, that's a really nice tune, and um, you guys should hear the album version of it because. That, that's what people who didn't rehearse even once sound like. Imagine what a band. Sounds pretty similar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Well, you know, we did one of yours. How about we do one of mine now? I kind of thought it'd be funny to, not funny, maybe fun, to see what a Boogaloo Squad song might sound like with this instrumentation, with a little bit of upright bass and with uh, maybe piano instead of organ. I think it's going to be interesting and, I don't know, maybe weird. But uh, so this is a song I wrote called Squad Goals. Um, when I named the band JV's Boogaloo Squad, I was not aware of the cool use of the word squad. Like it was seven or eight years ago, and like I, it like hadn't even entered my radar yet that people are like, "Oh, the squad!" Like, like I was. I just hope everyone knows like I wasn't trying to be cool. Like, <laughs> this is the a thing in my life is I I don't change like how I dress or act or whatever. But because styles and things are cyclical, like every nine years, something I'm already doing becomes trendy. And people are like, oh, you're on that trend. It's like, no. I just wait for it to come <laughs> yeah, around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got both sides of like the bad with the boogaloo. <laughs> yeah, and, like, that's the true. Good with the squad. Yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. squad kind of worked out. And then in the last year, boogaloo, which is a New York based form of Latin dance. I don't know what these people are talking about yeah. with their other kind of boogaloo. Not not the right kind. Not cool. Gu- not cool guys. You won't be there, Boogaloo Boys. No. <laughs> I do hope because when when I found out that Boogaloo Boys was a white supremacist group, I had made my website have like a splash page before you enter that's just Black Lives Matter stuff. <laughs> like literally, like Smart. it's just like it's like the it's like say their names. It's like Black Lives Matter. It's like. And then my board was like, if you have a problem with any of this, like, you shouldn't continue on to my website. <laughs> and there's like a link, like, you can donate to these things and whatever. Because I was like, I don't want a single person being like, think, thinking even for a second that like, JV's Boogaloo Squad is like a band for their, for their thing. I don't like them. Yeah. I wish they would go away. <sighs> okay. <laughs> this is uh, one of the earliest JV's Boogaloo so- Squad. JV's Boogaloo Squad songs. It's called Squad Goals. I wrote it because I realized I hadn't actually, I'd written a couple of songs for the band, but I hadn't actually written like a, a proper Boogaloo. And so this was my attempt at doing that. And um, yeah, here we go. One, two, one, two,
actually in the when I play that song live with with Boogaloo Squad, I always I always do the maze fish. There's the fish quote that I like pretty much always do. The peak of the solo, like. Adam, Adam, and I always laugh, and then no one else really knows what's going on. Um, okay, super fun. Um, I didn't mention this, but uh, people have been watching the show enough now that I hope they know that um, there's a certain point in the show where I'm looking for questions from uh, our live viewers for Mark. I forgot to put it out there, but uh, maybe let's even give them a minute. Does anyone have a question for Mark about playing the upright bass? About growing a gangly pandemic beard. I mean, it's about, been a year. About, it's uh... Good There's only, like, one question that came in really early in the show. What is it? <laughs> Can so you get it? It's a direct opportunity for Mark. Are any of your students, because you were talking so much about teaching, mm -hmm. she wanted to know if any of your students were actually in the room tonight, if you caught anybody there, and or do your students listen to your YouTube shows, and she subscribed earlier. Uh... Anyone? Do, do you mean like any of are any of These us guys? Mark's yeah, students? I think you're you're the youngest of. I'm the gonna go four with. Of I'm us. older than you. You're older than me. Yeah. Oh, you're 87, aren't you? Oh, you, you, you sneaky guy. <laughs> yeah, sneaky, sneaky guy. Just, um, no, none of my students are here. Uh, <laughs> we're on lockdown. Um, I mean, I've I've definitely learned a lot from you over the years, Mark. I have learned much from you. Yeah. As well. That's why I said it kind of jokingly, but it's also really true. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, yeah, I've learned a lot from you. Yeah. There you go. Love you, buddy. Yeah. Uh, you know, look at us, man, being uncomfortable with. Well, actually, we're like we're at eleven years. Like eleven years, kind of like right now ish. Yeah, because right, it was at the end of school. Since I met, since I met you, yeah, I didn't know you during school because you were a U of T guy and I was a Humber guy. And never the twain shall meet. Yeah, but then like literally the summer we both graduated, we met and uh, became fast friends. Yeah. We've been in bands, done lots of cool stuff together, like Rorschach. I didn't even tell the story of when we were in Banff that you broke your leg. <laughs> oh my god! Right before we went to Banff, I did, and you you took care of me. Yeah, like. So the Banff Center is like set in this beautiful picture. Yeah, it's, in the, it's in the mountains. <laughs> it's up in the mountains. And like it's, I mean, you know, there's ramps and things, but it's not the friendliest. It's, it's, I don't know if they've maybe fixed some of these problems, but it's definitely like a bit of an ableist situation. It's not easy to get around if you're in a chair or walking on crutches or whatever. And Mark's got this big bass, and so for two weeks, I basically carried your bass everywhere. Yeah, as you hobbled around from room to room, and then we, you didn't get yeah. to go on. We anywhere. got a room upgrade though because of it. That's right, we You're did. Right. We had that huge <laughs> yeah. room because you <laughs> because we were roommates. <laughs> we had to. It was too far to walk all oh, the way to the. That house. was so sweet. We had to, like it was this really spacious. Which, like, and you needed it. I did. Like, I, I had a broken leg. We weren't, like, using it, then, and someone who needed it more could have or whatever. But, like, <laughs> yeah. It was it was nice for me as your um, caretaker to have that extra yeah. space. Yeah. Two more came in on Facebook just now. Mm. Is this from Will Fisher? Oh, jeez. Oh, jeez. How's Mark Godfrey at Limbo? How are you at Limbo? Yeah. Yes. How are you at Limbo? Probably terrific. Oh, wait, do you remember when we were on tour with Barb? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we played Limbo in the hotel with the, room? Uh, the, you, know, you know those big cylindrical pillows? I forgot about yeah. that. Yeah. Body pillow kind of thing? Yeah, but like some hotels just have the decorative ones. We, we had some Limbo competitions. We've, we've had some fun nights on the road in that Barbara Lika band, mm -hmm. where maybe we got into the green room refreshments a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know? And yeah. uh, I, think Mark, I think Mark was a Limbo champion that night. That was a good night. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lonnie, what's the other question? Our last one from Conrad Gale. Who's your go-to influence on composition, Mark? So, Mark, who is your go-to influence on composition? Great question. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's a go-to. That's a hard question. To who pin do it like? down to one. Who do you like? I mean, 
<laughs> I really like Peter Gabriel. <laughs> and that's that's not the I mean it's yeah, it depends on the day. Uh I don't yeah, that's such a hard open-ended question. Um Yeah, I don't I don't know that I can I mean I've been listening to a lot of Bach lately. Um Peter Gabriel Glenn Gould Bach. plays Bach. These are good. These are good answers. Yeah. A lot of Brian Eno. I mean, my diet during the pandemic has been so... I don't know if you guys have thought this as well, but just like the stuff that I usually listen to hasn't been what I would usually gravitate towards. So like... I'm still just working through my dad's record collection kind of. So a lot of Peter Gabriel for me too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those solo records, I I love all four of them. They're so good. It's like they're... The writing and like it's cool because you can hear his progression of like how he's getting some of the sounds at a time that like you couldn't really capture sounds the same way right like sure like we can like pick a patch and you plug and play and you're good to go but like when you think about those records were like you know between five to six years making all of them um it's really cool to kind of hear how things have moved and to like to listen to it now being like 30 40 years removed from it yeah um anyways all right, there you go, well, Conrad. We're going to close with uh, Salisbury Hill. Salisbury Hill. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was thinking maybe uh, Je Sans Frontières. You know? <laughs> yeah. Or like a... Hey. <laughs> yeah. No, we're not going to do any of that. We actually thought it would be fun to play a song. There's certain songs um, when you're a jobbing musician, a musician where you've kind of played them to death and you've played them so many times that you almost can't imagine enjoying playing them anymore. But the one fun thing about the pandemic is we're all unsick of these songs. Like there's all these songs that I used to be so sick of playing that now I'm like, I like superstition. I, now if I hear it, I'm not like, Oh, that's that song I played a million times. I'm like, Oh, that's that song. That's the funkiest song ever. Like, you know, well, and also when you teach it to someone, so like again, the reason I said this tune is because it's like I've had we're not a playing superstition, by the way. Yeah, we're, <laughs> <laughs> though I did teach that to someone the other day, and it, I had a riot doing so. Um, but it's like you get inside these recordings in a different way. Again, listening to them, like because I haven't like analyzed how this tune is played in like fifteen years. Yeah, you know, but like teaching someone is like, oh yeah, like this is what you got to get into. So Anyways. the song we're going to play, everyone, you're probably just like, toss the song. <laughs> um, it's a song by The Meters, a band from New Orleans. Uh, probably one of the most frequently incorrectly played songs by cover bands, and there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> but it is true. A lot, of, a lot of you know what I'm talking about. And uh, we're going to play Sissy Strut, probably also incorrectly. Probably incorrectly, yeah. <laughs> yeah let's do the intro. The vocal. Oh, yeah. Uh, one more. <laughs> Is it four full beats and then ya? Yeah? <laughs> I don't know. I thought it was short. Or is it two? Is it? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Oh. Sure, I feel like it starts. Start on three. Or on two. Uh, Let's say two. It's two. Sure. Let's go with two. Okay. So wait, it's two beats of ah. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. And then two beats of ya. Yeah? No, like, one beat. No. One like, beat. Like, yeah. The ya's on yeah. four. Yeah. Well, yeah. the ya's on four. Yeah, it's yeah. like it's a yaw and a clap, right? Oh, that's... isn't this fun watching us figure this out? Is, is no oh. <laughs> Turns out we can't, we can't do these. Right? Yeah. That's, well. Yeah, I think it's a three beat intro. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let's do it. I'll count it in four, okay. and then we'll do a three beat intro, <laughs> and then we'll play the song. Okay, one, two. Three, four. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs>
Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> There's yeah. one at the end. Right, totally. Uh, okay, everybody. Thank you so much for watching episode five of Six Feet from Stardom. Give it up in your homes for Rich Grossman, Jeff Halschuk, and of course our special guest Mark Godfrey. Uh, you should buy his albums online, and you should tip us for this show if you enjoyed it. If you hated it, I don't expect you to pay for that. That's that'd be silly. Um, but please, uh, we're doing all of this for tips, and um, it's a lot of fun. But it's also uh, we could use that scratch. You know what I'm saying? So uh, yeah, drop that down there. Um, once again, if you don't have the cash and you just enjoyed watching it, I appreciate you too. And uh, thanks. Next week, we have uh, an amazing vocalist, uh, Joanna Majoko, who just won the, uh, the, Emerging, Jazz Artist. the Emerging Jazz Artist Prize in Toronto, in Toronto, which is a big deal. And she's a big deal. And she's incredible. So you got to watch next week. She's, I think, one of the most exciting uh, singers in the country and maybe the world, frankly. So check it out next week. And uh, we'll see you then. Bye, everybody. <laughs>